Hello and welcome to Project Noon, a platform dedicated to exploring Hindu-Muslim dialogue. Our guest today is Dr. Zachary Markwith. A brief introduction. Uh, Dr. Zachary is the Education Director at uh, Islamic Networks Group. He received his PhD in Islamic Studies from the Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley, California. He also earned an MA in Comparative Religious Studies at the George Washington University and a BA in Islamic and Near Eastern Studies at the University of California, Santa Barbara. His research and teaching focus on Islamic sacred texts, early Sufism, Sunni-Shi'i relations, and the comparative study of religions. He's the author of One God, Many Prophets, The Universal Wisdom of Islam, and the forthcoming book, And When I Love Them, The Hadith and Nawafil and the Formation of Sufism. Uh, Dr. Marquez, thank you for joining us and thank you for your valuable time. Thank you for the kind invitation, Dr. Ismail. It's it's really a joy and a pleasure to, to be here with you. And uh, I'm, I'm fascinated by Project Noon and the work you're doing to uh, improve uh, Muslim-Hindu relations. So before I get to your book, One God, Many Prophets, which is actually the topic of today's discussion, before we get to that, I just want to read out a small quote from your book, uh, which, as it were, which I think is what I want to do in today's discussion and what I want to unpack in today's discussion. So uh, the quote is from the second chapter, where you say that perhaps more than other religions, Hinduism and Islam are able to accept the multiplicity of religions that lead to the divine reality because they stand at the alpha and omega points in the cycle of creation. Now, this point is, of course, also mentioned by René Guénon in his book, uh, Studies on Hinduism, in one of his essays, and which is, in fact, also uh, uh, quoted on the mission statement, as it were, of our website. The fact that Hinduism and Islam uniquely uh, have certain qualities about them, which predispose them to a universalist view of religion and a universalist view of uh, uh, wisdom or prophecy. So this is something I, I want to I want us to unpack in today's discussion you know more broadly. Uh, your book professor uh, Dr. Markwith uh, or sorry Zach, if I can call you uh, is uh, one God many prophets, the universal wisdom of Islam. Yes. Can you please unpack that title for us? What stands behind it and what is the universal wisdom? Yes, yes. So you raise a number of, of interesting points and starting with the title, uh, the title was, was actually borrowed from a chapter of um, Dr. Saito Hussain Nasser's The Heart of Islam. I, I studied with him at the George Washington University where I focused on uh, Islam and Hinduism, and you know, he it really uh, discusses the, the the title. First of all, the the idea that there's one transcendent and eminent reality or presence that um, is the principle of all of creation, of all of existence, and in different traditions and different cultures, it's known by by different names. Of course, God. Uh, Allah, Brahman, Yahweh, um, and it, and not only known by different names, but envis envisaged in in different ways. So sometimes you have um, a personal a God, sometimes an impersonal essence that's beyond form, beyond qualification, and occasionally a, a tradition, you know, or, or you know, quite frequently actually will have both dimensions. Um, and it's certainly present in Islam. It's the central tenet in Islam, the idea that there's one God uh, from the, the Shahada, the testimony of faith, la ilaha illallah, which can mean, you know, literally there is no God but God, but also that there is no, uh, there is no reality except God, no ultimate reality. Uh, and then the idea of many prophets the Quran uh, articulates this very well, uh, mentioning prophets in the, the Abrahamic traditions, you know, starting with, with Adam and Noah, Abraham, Moses, Jesus, 
and Muhammad as the seal of the prophets. But it also mentions to, to every nation, to every community, we've sent a messenger. And there are some that we have told you about in this book, and there are some that we have not told you about, which has led many Muslim scholars, uh, mystics, philosophers, theologians, to entertain the idea that prophets from the East, from the, the Indian traditions, uh, from, from the Chinese traditions, um, the Buddha, Lao Tzu, Krishna, may have been divine uh, prophets or messengers, um, and then also not limited to the East, to you know, the, the Greco-Egyptian philosophical tradition, figures like Hermes and Plato, um, and then even indigenous um, teachings across the world, in the Americas, in Africa, in Australia. Um, there is certainly the idea in all of these traditions of a, a transcendent principle, the great spirit, for example, um, that permeates all of existence. So, so really the title gets to the, the idea of, of oneness and multiplicity um, and, a, and a oneness that doesn't uh, seek to erase multiplicity. And I think the, the symbol that you um, have, have called this project, uh, pro, uh, you know, Project Noon, um, of course, it's the Arabic letter, and um, it's, it's shaped like, almost like a, a, the letter U in Arabic. Um, at the top, the points sort of converge, and there's a dot at the top. And the dot in Genoz Este on the letter Noon symbolizes that principle, that oneness that's shared by different traditions, certainly in, in Hinduism as, as Brahman, uh, in, in Islam as Allah, and he discusses how the, the point at the top represents this, the, the, the earliest, um, Hinduism is certainly among the earliest traditions, Islam as, as sort of the, the last tradition, uh, representing the, the other um, arch, and they both point towards that principle. So the, you know, the letter Nun, uh, the, the, the beginning sort of arch represents, uh, according to Guénon, Hinduism, and and the the other arch represents, in his view, Islam as the you know one of the oldest traditions and and also uh, the final tradition in his view, and and the point at the top is is representing this this transcendent and eminent principle that's shared. Right. So I think it's quite significant. Um, you know, to, to, to reflect on, on, you know, at the, on the one hand, um, our, the, the unity of existence, um, and, and on the other, uh, how is it that we can preserve the, the diversity of these paths? Right. Right. Uh, I, I think what the perennialist or the traditionalist view offers us is a comprehensive alternative to the two extremes of, you know, on the one hand, you have uh, the uh, kind of uh, uh, simplistic uh, and uh, generalizing idea that all religions are the same, you know, th th this, and I mean, which is again, a, uh, it has deep uh, secular resonances as it were, because, you know, it, it reduces these you know uh, religions to the superficial level as it were or the uh, you know and it generally lacks the vertical dimension when it says this that you know all religions are essentially the same you know they're, they're all teaching you good things or you know uh, to, to be a good human being uh, but when you when you're not specific about that statement uh, that can be problematic because you what you have in mind is a certain idea of what it means to be religious or a certain idea of what it is what is properly uh, uh, religious or you know what is properly moral or the ethical thing to do and uh, the question of difference or diversity tends to be whitewashed under under the the name of that uh, you know uh, common wisdom that common superficial idea of wisdom of religions so i think the perennialist view is a is a very robust alternative among these uh, uh, options where at the, at the same time you want to uh, 
maintain the and respect the diversity and the distinctness of each tradition in itself. But then you also recognize the uh, underlying core, uh, which is common to all of them. Yes, yes, I, I would agree. Um, my thinking since I wrote, you know, One God, Many Prophets has, has changed uh, somewhat in certain places. Um, but I still hold to the core idea that, you know, Ananda Kumar Swami stated that that all paths lead to the same summit. So here, the idea is that the paths themselves up the mountain are distinct or diverse. Um, but but the summit, um, in his view, is is a shared uh, is a shared summit. Um, and you know, I I I I largely agree, agree that we we have to maintain um, the distinctness that makes things beautiful and true. Um, and and but I think I think the idea of you know just simply declaring that all religions are the same, you know, it comes from perhaps a positive in, uh, impulse initially, in that you know people have seen fighting throughout the the, the centuries. Um, you know, it, it, certainly in recent centuries, it's been it, that conflict has been as inspired by secular ideologies, um, by by capitalism, by by communism, by fascism, for example. Um, but we still have um, religious extremism that you, you know is you know used often in 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 concert with secular forces to um for the sake of gaining land resources and power and so so extremist versions of religion um you know i i i think lead people to that point where they say well can't you know we just all agree on 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 our similarities and and sort of do away with our differences um but you're right the traditionalists or, or, or perennialists sort of take a middle path which is which is that you know the the distinct aspects of each religion are what enable people to to reach their the 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 common uh, transcendent reality and and also the common um, say divine names and attributes that are also shared compassion peace justice love uh, by following the distinct paths. Um, and when I say path, you know, in Islam, it's sort of clearly defined um, as, on the one hand, the Sharia, the divine law, and the Tariqa, or the spiritual path, which is often synonymous with Sufism. Um, and so these, this, this sort of um, twofold path uh, is, is to remain uh, somewhat distinct. Um, but we also see instances in India uh, in pre-modern India, but even today, I think, where there were um, sort of uh, teachers who, who you know, might be a Muslim Sufi teacher who would teach not only Muslims, but also Hindus and Sikhs. And likewise, right. great Hindu saints would, would sometimes teach uh, Muslims. And, and so there are uh, individuals and movements that, because of certain unique circumstances, um, did did create uh, something of a synthesis, and and I'm not entirely against that. I think mm -hmm. I think you have to look at the individual's context, uh, the context of each community. Um, however, um, I do think what's most efficacious, what we're 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 most sure that works, is to to follow um, you know one path as as well as one can while drawing inspiration from from other other traditions right and you know uh, i mean just to put it on a, in a very crude sense do you think it's it's true to say that uh, the perennialist uh, view is to practice one religion but to be inspired by uh, you know uh, all the religions as it were or by multiple religions Yes. Well, I, I, yes, I think broadly speaking that that is true when you're looking at um, certainly Guénon and René Guénon and um, those who influenced him, people like uh, Ivan Agueli, 
right. uh, who who's, who's who actually introduced Geno to to Islam and Sufism, right. um, and and also it seems uh, Ananda Kumaraswamy. Um, in you know there are other per, sort of perennialist or traditionalist thinkers who who have sort of um, maintained that that perspective, and then there are others who were a bit, um, you know, their lives and experiences were, were a bit different. You know, we can cite the example of Houston Smith, right. um, who, who has a unique case where, you know, he's an eminent scholar of, of comparative religious studies and, um, you know, born, born Christian to, to missionary parents and always sort of maintained a fidelity to that tradition while at the same time, uh, practicing other traditions in in succession, you know, as as he sort of mm. learned about them, and and often uh, for for you know a decade or more at a time, he would practice Buddhism and uh, Islam, um, not really uh, in a superficial way, but but with with deep commitment. Um, I had the you know the blessing of of meeting him, um, and so in some sense, his life kind of resembles. Although there are differences, um, Sri Ramakrishna, the the great yeah. Hindu saint, yeah. who you know I write about in in the second chapter of the book, who you know he he practiced uh, a, a, a bhakti form of of Hinduism, he was devoted to the goddess Kali, and according to you know uh, the his his writings and and saints and and the biographies about him. Kali had given him permission to practice other religious forms. Okay. And so for short periods, he, he practiced uh, Christianity, Islam, and um, other, other forms of Hinduism, including um, Advaita Vedanta, and, and devoted himself completely to those forms. So, so I, I think it's, it's difficult to say anything absolute about you know, how, how it is that, again, individuals and communities choose to to practice but i think you know my my under, my limited understanding is that you know it is more helpful to to uh focus on on one tradition uh, again while drawing inspiration from other other faiths but islam is an interesting interesting tradition because we don't really see other holy books and other prophets as as being as being outside of islam hmm. in some sense they're they're um, integrated into the tradition, as I mentioned earlier. The belief that every nation, every community was sent a prophet. The the idea that there are multiple multiple divine books. Um, so one can read, for example, not only the Bible and the Quran as revelation, but in my view, um, the Vedas, the Upanishads, the Bhagavad Gita. Um, you know, and, and also texts from, from other traditions. You know, I think uh, uh, that aspect of recognizing revelation uh, in other traditions apart from one's own, I think that also requires a certain spiritual intuition uh, or a spiritual skill uh, or a spiritual uh, cultivation that you already possess in order to identify that wisdom within your own tradition itself. For example, uh, if you don't have that kind of intuitive grasp of, the, of, of certain wisdom or certain realities, then it, it becomes difficult for you to grasp them in other traditions as well. Um, I mean, which is, this is an, an interesting point, but you know, I just want to come, come back to one you know, possible objection um, that can be made to uh, this reading of you know, such verses in the Quran. Uh, from the Muslim side, and you know, this might be the common view among many Muslims, that uh, uh, while we maintain that God has revealed uh, to other people as well, apart from our own, and has sent other prophets, uh, but now those revelations have somehow been abrogated. Uh, this is, of course, the, the common view. Could you uh, respond to that? And you know, what are the logical implications of this view for the mercy of God? How it views, you know, God's mercy and justice itself. Yes, this is a very good point uh, that you're raising, and 
I address it in places in the in the book. Um, you know, as you mentioned, the, there there is the view among Muslim scholars that um, previous revelations have been abrogated. That is, with with the coming of um, the Quran and the the last prophet, um, the the other religions are no longer fully efficacious. And um, but there, even with this view, there are certain qualifications attached to it that someone has to encounter a true, authentic representation of Islam um, in order for them to be sort of responsible for accepting the new faith. And I, I think as we know what most people see in the media, um, you know, what they might read in, in many, many books uh, isn't, isn't an accurate representation of Islam. Um, so, um, you know, but but it also raises certain problems if one accepts the idea of abrogation. Um, the Quran, it seems to me, um, doesn't fully endorse this this position. For example, there there are the verses: uh, "Those who believe in this message," um, in other words, the Quran, and the Jews, the Christians, the Sabians, any who believe in one God, and the last day and do righteous deeds no fear shall come upon them neither neither shall they grieve so this posits the idea of you know universal salvation for people of other faiths and even for people who simply believe in in god and and live uh with virtue um it doesn't seem to me that it's it speaks to the idea of, of abrogation. Now, it certainly encourages people in its texts, like other religious texts, to accept the 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 current message. In this case, the the Quran and the teachings of of the Prophet. Um, however, it's not an absolute statement, and we see from the earliest um, years in the Prophet's life um, and and subsequent centuries. That the people of the book, starting with with um, Jews, Christians, and shortly thereafter Zoroastrians, and then in the seventh century, um, uh, in the middle of the seventh century, uh, going into the eighth century, um, Buddhists and Hindus and others were accepted as people of the book, were given religious protections. There wasn't a sense that everyone had to convert to Islam, and in fact, the Prophet wrote a series of covenants. A series of uh, treat treatises and, and treaties and 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 texts that were either he likely uh, dictated them, um, but it's catalog. These are cataloged by a scholar, uh, Dr. John Andrew Morrow, in his book *The Covenants of the Prophet Muhammad with Christians*, where it not only accepts other faiths but requires Muslims to protect other faiths, to protect their places of worship, to allow religious freedom and many, many other rights. And these rights were then again extended uh, beyond Christians and Jews who were the, the you know, sort of monotheists of the, of, the, of the Arabian Peninsula together with other groups. Um, it was, th these rights were extended to, to Hindus, Buddhists and others. So um, I, I, I don't think abrogation is, is convincing from, uh, from a historical point of view, uh, but also from a, a sort of um, theological point of view, it raises many problems. You mentioned um, justice and mercy. Um, you know, it's difficult for people to believe um, that God could remain just and merciful and give um, the one true religion to only a limited segment of humanity, be they Christians, Muslims, Hindus, or anyone else. So if God you know, to state it differently, if God is just and merciful, then uh, quite simply, um, there, there has to be access um, on the one hand to the divine presence and, and on the other hand to, to salvation, <clears throat> to, um, you know, paradise. There has to be access for every uh, community on earth uh, through the teachings that are most accessible to them. And you can even raise, um, you know, a different talk up, speak about this differently. Um, I, I think that 
that pluralism is really an imperative uh, if one maintains, again, that God is just and merciful. Um, so, so let's just take the, the example of, of um, you know, Judaism. If God had completely abrogated Judaism um, and said that, you know, all Jews have to accept Islam, um, then, you know, there would be no difference between, on the one hand, um, you know, a, 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 a Jewish person who acts justly, um, let's say, uh, and, and Frank and Noam Chomsky who, who act justly, um, and, and, and someone like, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu who doesn't. Now it seems clear that the, the people in the Jewish faith and tradition who, 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 um, treat their neighbor as they want to be treated, who, who follow the laws of thou shall not kill, thou shall not steal, as found in the Hebrew Bible, that they will be judged differently from those Jews who do not follow their tradition. Right. And that, that would hold true for other pre-Islamic peoples as well. Uh, so I think, I think Muslims should encourage people of other faiths to, to follow their traditions, be they, you know, Judaism, Christianity, uh, um, certainly Hinduism, Buddhism, and other faiths, and often not, not only follow them, but learn from them. Um, there, there are ethical teachings in all of these faiths that can teach us something about our own faith, especially when it's stated somewhat differently. Um, you know, we, we sort of, we sort of learn, um, you know, not only about theology and, and, and metaphysics, but, but also about the, the ethical life, um, and, 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 you know, what it means to, um, again, to follow the golden rule. Right. Well, uh, one uh, question that comes to mind is, uh, to what extent uh, must we emphasize the importance of a traditional form for these values? I mean, for example, if you consider the case of uh, something like Sikhism, uh, which again is a you know, post-Muhammadan uh, religion, um, how would the perennialist view uh, Sikhism, and uh, or you know, you know, something even uh, less systematic or you know, less in the form of religion itself, you know. Uh, consider a an individual's own idiosyncratic quest for for truth and for wisdom, in which he mixes and he uh, matches you know, different teachings uh, based on his own journey and his own exploration. Uh, because the, the the idea of God's justice and mercy being available to everyone would entail that. Uh, I mean, why should that be restricted to someone who's following a traditional form of uh, you know religion or wisdom? Yes, yes. Um, I, I would tend to agree. Um, and, you know, it depends on who you ask. So, you know, I'm, I'm sort of, a, you know, against the idea that, that there should be um, a, you know, a, a group of traditionalist or perennialist scholars who make pronouncements on what is orthodox and what isn't in, in an absolute sense. I think, I think we can sort of broadly identify which which wisdom teachings um, uh, we resonate with and have been have been you know useful and beneficial to humanity but you know I I, I haven't seen any any uh, extensive pronouncements on um, you know some of these post Mohammedan um, traditions but but you know I there 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 generally has been a positive assessment of Sikhism by most of the traditionalists and perennialists. And again, when you look to India, um, you know, figures like Ramakrishna, the, the original Sai Baba, um, and even, even Akbar, um, uh, you know, in the, in the Mughal dynasty, um, both Hindus and Muslims um, were, were willing to learn for, about other faiths. Um, and, and that continues into the, the contemporary period. There are a number of Chishti 
Sufis who continue to to hold Hindu teachings very dear. Um, and and I think, you know, not only in India, but in the US, we have unique circumstances where some people, they, they, they do create a sort of synthesis. Um, and, you know, I, I think it's, it's, um, it's certainly possible, you know, going back to the Quranic verse, it sort of emphasizes those who believe in this message, Christians, Jews, the Sabians, it emphasizes those in a specific religious path. But then it opens the door towards any who believe in God and the last day and uh, live righteously. So, you know, that that opens the, the door towards towards sort of uh, any anyone who devotes themselves to the divine, to the sacred with sincerity and tries to to treat their you know, fellow um, humans and and the rest of creation well. So, so yes, I, I think it's possible. And I think in some cases um, it produces, um, you know, amazing results. Someone like, again, like Ramakrishna. Um, so Sikhism, I, I, I do believe that it's, it's an inspired tradition. Um, I can't speak with certainty about this. I don't think anyone, you know, is able to, but but you you know you if you read the the writings of Guru Nanak and and many of the other um, Sikh gurus, um, you see um, a a you know what what seems to be uh, writings that are that are divinely inspired, um, and you know it doesn't mean that every Sikh just like not every Muslim or Hindu throughout history has lived up to those teachings, but. Um, but but I, I I do think that it it, it sort of represents um, not only a historical um, drawing from Hinduism and Islam, but but some sort of vertical connection that the the founder and and the subsequent gurus had. But it's it's difficult to say you know exactly what that is. Is it is it um, a form of ilham as we would say in Islam, mm -hmm. a form a form of inspiration? Um, that would be my my um, my best guess. Right. Uh, well, Zach. So I mean, so far we've been talking about universalism, uh, perennialism, and uh, the Islamic uh, uh, support within the Islamic tradition for a universalist view of religion. Uh, coming to the question of Hinduism. Um, of course, one thing that we find explicitly in the Quran is there is this mention of the uh, Semitic prophets. Uh, the you know the biblical, the Judeo-Christian tradition is referenced over there, uh, and uh, it might be a matter of prudence that you know other or foreign uh, traditions were not mentioned because, uh, as you mentioned in the beginning as well, the Quran says that. Uh, some of them, some of the prophets we've mentioned by name, and some we've not informed you by name. And of course, the um, prophetic tradition, the Hadith maintains that there are over one one lakh twenty five thousand prophets uh, that have appeared. So, in that view, there must these other traditions must also emanate from some of the other prophetic, uh, you know, origin or source or foundation, but. How do we view these apparently contradictory elements in Hinduism and Islam? And I mean, these entirely different frames of mind or universes, as it were, uh, when viewed on an on a on, on first impression, it, it appears as if they are the mutual opposite of each other. Uh, and I mean, particularly when you look at the the, the question of uh, idolatry in Islam. And when you look at the many, many image involved worship practices in Hinduism, if, if we want to avoid the term idolatry, because again, again it, it contains a judgment about uh, what, you, what you're talking about. Um, how would you situate these two traditions uh, from a universalist or perennialist point of view? Yes, yes, that's, that's a, a good question. Um, I, well, I think, I think one has to first, you know, specify what, what the Quran and, and the teachings of Muhammad are discussing when they, when they discuss idolatry. It seems specific to, you know, um, 7th century Arabia. 
and and the pre-Islamic uh, practices that were present there. It wasn't simply about the images. There was also, uh, you know, unjust uh, social practices and uh, a hierarchy that um, took advantage of the poor, of um, orphans, widows, uh, people from from rival tribes, mm-hmm. and so the idolatry that was practiced in Mecca at the time uh, was in the context of this, this, um, this unjust sort of social order. Uh, but when the prophet entered the Kaaba to remove the idols, he, he according to, to some narrations, placed his hands, hands over an image of, of Mary and Jesus and protected it. And so there was a distinction between um, these these other uh, depictions, idols that had sort of degenerated over time and uh, were were used um, in part to to exploit people and and images from other traditions that uh, were clearly in some sense sacred. Mm. Um, it didn't mean that that the prophet integrated devotion uh, via an image into into his his practice but he recognized that it was it was all right it seemed in some sense all right for christians um and so so i think i think you know when muslims early muslims again in the you know middle of the seventh century in iran in central asia what's now afghanistan uh and and other lands when they encountered buddhists and eventually, when they encountered Hindus shortly thereafter, um, there they there were images, there were statues, and they were not uh, viewed as uh, worthy of being certainly not destroyed. And in fact, they were granted legal protection uh, under Muslim rule. These these communities, and and you know, it was often because they could see. Um, that the people were were people of of compassion and justice, and if that was the case, then then their their religions were were uh, given again that legal protection and status. Um, you know, when you turn to 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 Hinduism in particular, um, it's quite clear when when one studies Hindu texts, um, when one speaks to um, you know Hindus themselves that at the the highest level uh the divine reality brahman is completely uh unqualified and formless um it's it's quite similar to 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 how muslims understand god and even um arguably you know uh more um i guess you would say apophatic um th- 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 this sense that God is even beyond the names and qualities we give God. Right, right. So, so no form, uh, whether whether it's a a cosmic form or whether it's um, a mental form, is is a suitable way of describing God. You know, there's a famous saying, "Neti neti," not this, not that. So, so they maintain that negation that, of course, we have in Islam, "La ilaha." You know, there there is no no God illallah except God. However, um, because God uh, God's presence permeates the cosmos, then God is seen as the the innermost essence of all things, including human beings. Um, you know the the with you know often in in the school of Advaita Vedanta, the the Atman, the innermost essence of the human being is seen as not uh, different from Brahman or, or the divine as such. Um, but that presence also permeates the, the, the avatars in Hinduism, um, the other, other sacred beings, those who, who we would, we would uh, call gods, but that's not really an accurate um, translation in my view. Um, but there is a multiplicity of, of sacred beings um, and, and, you know, coming at this from a Muslim perspective, you know, um, I, I <clears throat> have written about this, but, um, you know, we also have a multiplicity of sacred beings. You know, if, if someone 
is looking at Islam from the outside and sees, of course, the, the plurality of, of messengers and prophets, of angelic beings, of the Burak, who um, Muhammad rode through the heavens, um, of even, even on the, the, the mineral level, there's the Kaaba, there is, uh, on the plant level, there is the, the burning bush uh, mm -hmm. through which God speaks. There is the, the story of Sahleh and the she camel, which is considered sacred or a divine sign. And so when you read the Quran, you see that, you know, really everything in existence um, is considered um, a divine sign. Um, you know, what we would say, an uh, ayatollah, um, or, or, or even a divine name. And so, so in Islam, there are these three really grand books. Um, there's, there's the, which is considered a divine sign. There's the, the cosmos, uh, and everything upon it. And then there's the human being or the human soul. Um, so, you know, the, the Quran says, we'll, we'll show you our signs upon the horizons and within yourself until you realize that this is the truth. Um, so, so in some sense, we also believe that, that God's reality. course quite clear but but we often have a difficult time recognizing the divine in other traditions right well the, the, there's one um i know another quote from your book which i i'd like to read in this connection uh particularly about when, when you're speaking about idolatry and polytheism so you say that polytheism is the positing of more than one absolute while idolatry is the reduction of the absolute to the relative or the worshipping of man-made idols, pure and simple, neither of which refer to the sacred function revealed signs have in the various religions of humanity. Hinduism, for example, is a rich tradition wherein God reveals himself through almost an infinite varieties of forms without being reduced to these forms alone. Uh, if God can say through the theophany of the burning bush, truly I am God, there is no God but I, Quran 2014, or I am that I am, Exodus 3.14, then members of the Abrahamic family should not scoff at the manifestations of unity in the diverse revealed forms of other religions. The uncreated Quran itself makes use of the created form of the Arabic tongue, as well as the written form of the book through calligraphy, including paper and ink. Thus, the locus of manifestation for divine unity must out of necessity be a created form without being exhausted by that form. I think this uh, you know, brilliantly sums up uh, the... Oh, you know, what what we're talking about here? Yes. Well. Well. Thank you. I. I. Uh, you know. But yes, it seems clear when when um, when one looks at our own traditions, as as you mentioned, um, you know, the the burning bush, um, both both in the the Hebrew Bible and the Quran, uh, where God is God is speaking. Um, we also have have God speaking through through messengers and prophets. In Islam, um, of course, the Quran itself uh, is considered divine speech. But when you look at the, for example, the tradition of, uh, you know, the, the the Hadith Qudsi, the sacred saints, um, this is another form of of either revelation or inspiration, depending on your point of view, where God is speaking through the tongue of the Prophet. So when one reads, uh, for example, the Bhagavad Gita. And God is speaking through the tongue of Krishna. Uh, one could view this as as a kind of either uh, hadith Qudsi or or even a form of of revelation, where where God is speaking in the first person. Um, and you know, it's 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 not absent from our own tradition, and and it's certainly uh, present uh, in in others as well. Yeah, and I mean, it's it's of course also interesting that even in Hinduism itself. The Gita is viewed as Hadith Khutsi because it is uh, it is not Shruti, it is Smriti, it is the uh, later texts. Yeah. Yes, yes. Um, well, I mean, just to 
come back to the question of idolatry because I think this is a really big question and a really difficult, uh, you know, uh, issue for Muslims when it comes to understanding Hinduism or sympathizing with Hinduism. Uh, this is this this becomes a really uh, major stumbling block or a major obstacle in in trying to make dialogue uh, because you know shirk is the greatest sin in Islam the greatest affront to God or to reality or, and to oneself even um, what what more can be said about the difference between the you know Meccan polytheists or the Meccan mushrikeen or the Meccan pagans how is their shirk, uh, I mean, how is Hinduism to this Muslim mind viewpoint, how is it different from those other points? Yes, yes. So, so again, I think it depends on the context. So, you know, one is going to find, um, you know, certain forms of, of Hinduism, just like there are certain forms of Islam today um, that, that practice the teachings uh, compassionately and justly, um, and and others that don't, um, mm. others that 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 actually um, seek to preserve an unjust social hierarchy. But that's not only true in 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 mm. Hinduism. That's as I said, that's also true in certain certain Muslim contexts. Um, so there so there may be certain similarities in some cases, um, but but where you have um, Again, the the idea that the the logos can manifest in different ways in the form of a book, where where um, you know the Quran is considered the the word of God, and and the Quran also refers to Jesus as the word of God. So so it's clear that it can manifest in the in a sort of a human form, and and then again, God says, "I through the burning bush." Um, so I think we we can understand um, that this is possible through in other traditions that what we would consider the word of God can manifest in different forms, and that those forms um, are it's you know it's it's not only uh, not wrong to depict them but it's considered sacred for us not only to uh, recite the Quran but to write the Quran and for Christians to depict Jesus. Um, and, and so I do think it's possible in other forms for, for the logos to, to, to be depicted without it being idolatry. Um, it doesn't mean that Muslims should, um, uh, necessarily venerate those forms, but they can recognize that they're sacred to other communities. Um, to look at this, um, you know, s s somewhat differently, um, the, you know, I, I from, from, from sort of a, a one Sufi point of view, um, idolatry, you know, is not simply the, the positing that, you know, that, you know, or, or, or trying to re reject uh, the, the many depictions of God. And, and uh, because what that does um, is it, it actually creates a, a dualistic um, uh, theology where you know God is somehow right. above everything and creation is below and because we know that creation has power and knowledge and justice and, and compassion it creates so many separate gods with all of those qualities mm -hmm. so from one point of view um, you know it's it's actually idolatry not to see God in all of these forms to be a monotheist, you have to see that God is everywhere and ultimately everything. Right, right, right. Yeah, I mean, this is, of course, the distinction Ibn Arabi makes between Tawhid Ilahi and Tawhid Wujudi. Mm. Uh, you know, uh, the oneness of God and the oneness of being. Uh, well, I, I think if. You, you you also mentioned in another point you reference uh, Titus Burkhart where his view of Islamic art uh, is that uh, which is you know something I found again very interesting is that Islamic art is not so much iconoclastic as it is aniconic. 
Right. 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 And this is important to keep in mind. Um, you know, when, when Muslims, again, you know, starting with the prophet himself encountered, um, icons of, of Jesus and Mary, he, he did not destroy them. He protected them. He preserved them with his own hands. Um, and this, this, you know, there, there, we really don't see instances in, in, um, sort of the pre-modern period where, where Muslims were destroying sacred art from other traditions. Um, so Muslims weren't iconoclastic. Um, it's only into, you know, the modern period. I mean, there were always, there were always some exceptions of throughout history, of course, but in the modern period where we see like, you know, groups like the Taliban destroying statues of the Buddha in mm-hmm. Afghanistan, which had survived, uh, you know, for, um, you know, under, under Muslim um, rule for, you know, uh, over, over a thousand years. So um, there, there, you know, I, I, I think, I think one does have to make a distinction between, you know, uh, you know, traditions that uh, seem to be revealed by God or inspired in some sense and their sacred art and um, idolatry in in the sense that it was practiced in in pre-islamic arabia um but but you know again going back to the sufis they would they would always point out that the the most important idol to look at is the idol of the nafs Mm. the the ego um the the base uh self and desires um and and that this is the this is the real um idol that has to be toppled um where where you know, we project um, God onto ourselves, and and uh, and then and then you know, really onto others as well. Um, so so, uh, but you know, it 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 doesn't mean that there 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 isn't uh, still idolatry. You know, there there are other forms that I, that that it takes as as well. I mean, you see it you see it in, in the form of of ideologies uh, in the modern and postmodern period. Um, you know, you, you see it in, in, you know, our obsessions with technology and entertainment, um, you, you, you see it, uh, in, in, you know, uh, nations that, that are devoted to a, a kind of extreme, extreme forms of nationalism that, um, that, that then use, uh, that ideology to oppress, um, you know, minority groups, people from other nations. So, so I think, I, I think if one is um, thinking clearly, one, one is looking at, you know, how is it that, that these, uh, you know, modern idols are, are, are controlling us. Right. Right. And I think, I mean, this, this really brings us back to uh, the point at which I mentioned earlier, and of course, uh, Professor Nasser uh, talks about this, where he says that, uh, I mean, a Muslim who cannot understand the doctrine of Vatat al-Wujud is unlikely to comprehend the Advaita doctrine in Hinduism, uh, which suggests that the uh, spiritual heart and the philosophical heart of these religions will remain inscrutable to you if you do not, to begin with, have a sense of the deepest aspects of your own tradition itself. And so, you know, questions of idolatry and of, you know, seeing God everywhere, all these questions remain inscrutable as long as you're just operating on that, on that level. And so it requires, uh, that, um, spiritual cultivation and that uh, spiritual intuition, uh, where you also again which which you, what you were suggesting about uh, uh, getting uh, above rising above the ego and uh, knotting the ego making yourself into nothing which seems like like a very interesting parallel between hinduism and islam that we have because in islam as it were i mean to, just to put it in, a, in in very crude terms in islam it seems that the emphasis is on removing the ego or in um, uh, realizing the nothingness of the ego and so what remains is nothing but the permanent and the absolute 
Whereas in Hinduism, the emphasis might be to uh, realize one's identity with that absolute to begin with and focusing on that. I mean, both seem seem to be two sides of the, of the same coin to, or, you know, two ways of look, of merging in the same direction, merging with the one, merging with the absolute. Yes, yes. And, and I think, you know, I'll just start with the, the fact that, um, and I'm, I, I know you're aware of this, um, but just for some of our listeners, um, that there are, of course, you know, many forms of, of, of Islam and, and, and Muslim spirituality, just as there are many forms of, of Hinduism, uh, Advaita being, being one of them. Um, but, but even within that school and tradition, there, there are many ways of, of interpreting it. Um, but I do think that there are important correspondences between um, the school of Ibn Arabi, which, mm-hmm. you know, posthumously after he passes away in 12, uh, 1240, uh, you know, eventually be, it becomes associated with the doctrine of Watat al-Wujud or the, the, the unity or oneness of existence or being. And, 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 and then on the other hand, as I said, a correspondence with the, the school of, of Advaita Vedanta, which, which really um, comes to fruition under, under Shankara. Um, so, yeah, there, there do seem to be different starting points um, <clears throat> within these traditions. As, as you mentioned, um, in Islam, there's, and, and certainly according to Ibn Arabi, <clears throat> what's emphasized is the, the non-existence of uh, creation and, and of uh, the servant or human being in particular. Um, and, and that, um, for him, it's, it's sort of an existential constant. Um, it's, it's the true reality of things, that, that creation and the human being are, are literally nothing and receive all of their uh, positive qualities from God, you know, right. the, the names that we receive. We're, we remain sort of contingent beings, but we receive, you know, knowledge and uh, compassion and, and justice and so forth, complete, completely from God. So it's realizing our non-existence and whatever, to whatever extent that we do exist, that's all from God. And as you said, in, in uh, Advaita, there's the, the, of course, positing that the innermost essence of the human being, Atman, is not other than Brahman. Um, and, and so, um, you know, but I think if we go a little bit deeper uh, on the Islamic side, we, we see that um, what's really non-existent in some sense, or, or you could say only exists through God, are the the lower levels of the human being, um, the, you know, the, the mind, the body, the soul. And, and that ultimately, uh, when you go to the innermost essence, we see, you know, uh, from the Quran, for example, we are nearer to the human being than his jugular vein, which suggests that, you know, God is, is in the heart. Similarly, there are many hadith that state, um, for example, um, the, the, uh, the heart of the faithful is the throne of the compassionate. So the seat of God, the throne of God is the heart. So the innermost essence of the human being is also God. Um, it's just that there aren't really two terms posited as you, as you find in Hinduism, you have Brahman and Atman. So you posit these two terms and then you say that they're non-dual. Mm-hmm. Whereas in Islam, uh, you know, I mean, of course, we have many names for God, but um, whether viewed objectively or subjectively, that reality is, is, is understood as, as Allah. Um, and, and so, you know, connected beneath the layers of the, the, the soul, the, the spirit, we, you know, we ultimately find God also within the human being in Islam. Um, and, and that, you know, that's why, uh, you know, many have, have seen the path as, as a way of, of entering the heart. Right. Right. Um, I think we, we're also nearing our time. 
Zach. And uh, before we come to a close, I think uh, another you know uh, thing which I find really fascinating is that uh, among some of the most brilliant contemporary writers or you know writers in the past uh, past century uh, on Hinduism and Islam and on you know Hindu Muslim uh, mutual understanding have been some of the perennialists uh, and of course again among the perennialists uh, many perennialists have been Muslim have been practicing Muslims two of the three fo founders of the perennialist school have been Muslims uh, what uh, so, so I mean, in that sense, I think the perennialist literature and the perennialist school of thought is really uh, a good resource in Hindu-Muslim dialogue and in understanding, uh, in mutual understanding, and you know, from from a from an in-depth point of view. Yes, um, you know, I'm I'm uh, as 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 I've you know read the text over the years, I I still you know resonate strongly with you know, much of what Guénon has written, René Guénon has written on, on Hinduism and Islam both, and also um, Ananda Kumaraswamy and, and others. Um, I, I think, um, you know, they, they, you know, in addition to, to sort of leading uh, traditionalists like Guénon and Kumaraswamy, we see, um, you know, work on, on uh, you know, Muslim Hindu studies, you know, being done by by people like Daru Shaku, the 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 Mughal um, Hin, um, Muslim prince, who was really the head of a translation movement of 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 Hindu texts, including the Upanishads, and many of these texts actually reach the the West via initially translations that that he that he um, either made or commissioned, um, you know. In, into Persian. So, so I think that, you know, there are many, um, you know, there's, there's, there's sort of vast precedent that, that one, you know, that has been set. Um, but, but the, the traditionalists are one uh, avenue uh, as well. And I think, you know, in, in India itself, you know, many of these, these figures who, who studied both traditions, um, you know, Ramakrishna comes to mind again, um, these are really invaluable um, uh, teachings and and uh, history uh, history that can sort of inform you know Muslim Hindu relations today. Um, but but yes, um, the, the I, I think I think the traditionalists or perennialists offer one important uh, perspective. Um, certainly, there are div diverse perspectives among them. Um, and 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 certain keys uh, for, for 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 readers today. Personally, my experience, uh, I mean, in my reading, uh, uh, when I initially read Shuan, I was really fascinated and uh, read him to some depth. Uh, and then, uh, when I came across some critical writings about his life, and uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, there's of course that that book by uh, Mark Sedgwick. Um, which uh, again, I was sort of disappointed not to find too much treatment of Shuan's own own writings in that book. <clears throat> that was more about uh, uh, the lives of these people. Um, and uh, later on, I, I I find myself coming back to him for the depth and the richness of his ideas and his writings, uh, and the whatever the reality of those events of, of uh, whatever is claimed about that uh, is irrelevant or secondary for me because what is of primary importance is what I'm learning through his writings. So uh, I, I found I found some interesting comments of yours in the footnotes so I, I'd be really interested to know what you have to say about that. Yes, yes. So I, so first I'll note that I published the book um, almost 10 years ago yes. and uh, I think you know, many of the, the central sort of theses still stand, uh, you know, especially the, the perennialist or traditionalist idea that, that all paths lead to the same summit. And in, in Shuan's terms, you know, the, the, the transcendent unity of religions. 
um, which, you know, from a traditionalist point of view that, you know, these traditions have, you know, exoteric forms that are more or less distinct and uh, various forms of, of esoterism that begin to converge, um, but are also distinct in some sense. And, and, uh, and then at the summit, the, the, the ultimate principle is, is one. Um, now, now this is an idea that, <clears throat> you know, I, I think, you know, as a Muslim, uh, I, <clears throat> excuse me, had, you know, had before I, I, uh, encountered the, the traditionalist writings, um, even Shuan, he said that this first idea was, um, sparked in him when he encountered a, a West African, uh, who, had, who was visiting West African Muslim who was visiting Europe. And he drew a, a circle in some dirt or the sand and then lines that pointed towards the middle and basically said, you know, the same, the same point, all paths lead to the center. Um, this was my experience encountering Sufi writings, you know, certainly in the, the writings of, of, of Persian poets like, like Rumi and, and uh, Hafez and uh, in the Quran itself, the oneness of God, the multiplicity of prophets, um, and also having had some direct experience with uh, Sufis uh, as well. Um, it, certainly not shared by all Sufis, but by, by many of them. Um, but, but in Shuan's case, you know, as I said, I wrote the book 10 years ago. Uh, I still think that, that he has valuable things to say and was, um, you know, for his time, quite, quite, uh, um, interesting and, and valuable <clears throat> the philosopher, theologian, but, <clears throat> you know, I, I do take the critique of, of Sedgwick and others um, into account. Uh, I subsequently took it into account. Um, it doesn't mean that what he wrote uh, should, should, should all, you know, necessarily all be thrown out, but there is a kind of authoritarianism that seems to me um, impacted his, his community. And, and at times you can perceive it in his writings that that there's you know that this vision that's being articulated is the only way of seeing things and and uh i think it is a help, helpful way of seeing things and i i borrow keys from it i still do but but there are other ways of of perceiving you know religion mysticism even even comparative religion that might be might be different um and you know that's not unique to Shuan. That this, this some of these challenges have have impacted other other thinkers. Um, you know, I you know I'll even per perceive some of that in my my earlier writings. Um, but yes, I think you can distinguish you know the, the the person from 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 his writings in some sense, and then also see how uh, you know there are from my perspective, you know, many valuable things to preserve. And some things in the writings that might be worth questioning, and someone has actually done this uh, quite recently. Um, Charles Upton, who's a right. you know uh, traditionalist uh, writing out of the U.S., um, he he wrote a, a book, uh, "The Way Forward for Perennialism After the Antinomianism After the Antinomianism of Frithjof Schuon." Um, no, I, I wouldn't necessarily agree with everything that Upton writes either, but but I think he he you know if you take sort of you know Sedgwick's work, which is which is you know more historical and not really looking at the writings, um, Upton does a better job of preserving, in my view, what's of value in the writings, but also taking into account some of the problems, um, you know. And, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, there are going to be many opinions on, on a figure like Shuan, who's, you know, on the one hand, the, the, the writings can be brilliant. And, and on the other hand, his, his life is somewhat, you know, controversial. So um, I'm, not, I'm not going to, to necessarily impose my view on, on anyone else. 
Uh, but just to say that I largely agree with you that that one should one should preserve what's what's of value um, in what anyone has said. Um, you know, and and today, you know, I, I I take from a number of of different sources. You know, certainly not limited to the traditionalists, but I also still value what the trad traditionalists have said. Um, I think someone like Henri Corban um, is is a helpful complement or or to to what they've done because his his vision, his depiction of you know the imagination, the imaginal world. Um, it sort of moves away from any reified, not only theology, but any reified metaphysic, where we could create a mental map of, you know, the cosmos of God, of a particular uh, traditional form, and think that it's completely static and one dimensional, and that our version is the only true version, which sort of replicates the um, exoteric exclusivism of some religious people when it when it's transposed on spiritual mystical or, or esoteric teachings where we reify a teaching and turn it into an ideology what korban does is he says you know it re and he's really taking from classical islam and sufism that um that there are theophanies divine theophanies or way of ways of God showing himself, what we would call divine signs or divine names that again appear on the cosmos and with, within ourselves. And these theophanies are, are constantly new. Um, they're constantly fresh. And so, you know, what we experience, you know, on the material level, uh, in, in dreams and visions, um, when when we're when we're reading and, and forming you know uh thoughts and so forth as well that, that um that there can be this this constant renewal because god you know god is ultimately unique uh and there's a trace of that uniqueness in all of creation in the ways that god is showing uh himself to us in the moment but also in the ways that each individual and each community um, you know, receives, understands, interprets those divine disclosures. And I think the perennialists speak about this in places, but it, you know, there's always the temptation to um, create a static uh, one size fits all theology that mm. just doesn't seem uh, to be in accord with the way that things are. And, it, and I believe it is connected to a kind of authoritarianism where we want to impose our vision on someone else. Right. Borrow from other people and, and, and we, only, um, we understand that that's how they're relating to the divine when they, when they um, you know, when they are able to share their experiences, their understandings. And so I, I do think there, there again, there are many things, uh, you know, Shuan and 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 others in the in the school that offer that are quite valuable. Right. I mean, I mean, just one final point about this because, uh, for me, uh, more uh, forceful than uh, Sedgwick's book was uh, Gregory Lipton's uh, Rethinking Ibn Arabi, where. Uh, uh, I mean, from a historical representation of Ibn Arabi and this, and a so, sort of perennialist appropriation uh, of Ibn Arabi to, for uh, in a different context and in, in, in a different um, style. Uh, I mean, another point of, that uh, Lipton I think brings up is about Shuan's uh, anti-Semitism, or you know, this kind of preference for the Aryan. Uh, and the superiority of the Aryan or the Semitic, and I mean this. This is really important again in the context of you know the idea that the Advaitic view is the supreme view, and that any other view is of course bound to be inf inferior. And of course, uh, Shuan says this about uh, other highly regarded figures in Hinduism itself. For example, he situates Shankara above Ramanuja, even though from the point of view of uh, the Vishist Advaita school, they would have their own reasons for 
viewing the Saguna Brahman as the absolute instead of the Nirguna Brahman, and they have a, a you know case for that as well. But again, I mean, this is not a universalist view in that sense because you are taking a very particular kind of view over here, and you are arguing a particular case, and you are saying that this is uh, the supreme case. Um, so the illusion of universalism, if it can be termed that way, where right, which is yes, I think what yes. Lipton talks about. Yeah, Lipton. I think Lipton's book is is brilliant. Um, Rethinking Ibn Arabi, and um, you know, on on so many uh, points that he makes. Um, but you mentioned the, the anti semitism. There, there, there are passages in Shuan that that uh, subtly, um, almost disparage, but certainly downgrade the 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 teachings of. Uh, the prophet of Ibn Arabi and sort of place, um, you know, what, what are considered Aryan, you know, teachings, um, those of Hinduism, of, of Christianity on a, on a sort of a higher plane. And I, I think that this is, this is related to, you know, a kind of, uh, Western, uh, racism and chauvinism. Um, I mean, Shuan went further than most in his appreciation of Islam. He sort he embraced the tradition mm-hmm. Um, but, but still, you know, posited that, that, um, you know, uh, you know, there, there was sort of a hierarchy of traditions within his universalism. And then Lipton does a good job of showing that universalism itself is a particular form that's not recognized as a form that it's, it's sort of understood that if we accept all religions in a traditionalist way or in another way, that this is just uh, you know, sort of uh, neutral from a value point of view, but but he shows that you no, know, it's 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 very much connected to a particular worldview, to a particular geography, and to a particular racial doctrine that developed out of Western Europe and then moves across the globe in the Americas uh, and and other places. Um, so, so I think I think Lipton is important, and it, it not only re- relates to anti-Semitism, it it, it relates to to gender uh, discussions of gender um, and and um, misogyny uh, in 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 the writings of Shuan, and in, in it also relates to to the political order, to how uh, you know um, empire was viewed. Uh, Shuan views it positively when um, you know, the historical record shows that there certainly were uh, virtuous kings throughout history, but there were also those who committed mass murder. Um, so, you know, it's, it, uh, you know, I, I, think, I think one has to take a critical eye uh, to, to these writings, but it doesn't mean that one throws them out. What I will say about Lipton's assessment, though, um, from my perspective, you know, having studied Ibn Arabi, his, his sort of one of the points that he's making is that Ibn Arabi wasn't a universalist. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and he's, he's sort of differentiating what Ibn Arabi said from what uh, the traditionalists say. And I would add a ca- caveat that, um, that, that it does seem that Ibn Arabi was a universalist in some sense but not a traditionalist uh, or a perennialist in the sense that we define those terms today. And so I, I would, I would um, categorize uh, Ibn Arabi as what might be called a Mohammedan pluralist. Mm-hmm. So when you read, for example, the Futuhat and the Fusus and, and the Tarjuman al you know, he has this famous poem, my heart has become capable of every form. And he goes through the various forms the, the Torah, the Quran, uh, he, he even says a, a temple for, for idols. And then he <clears throat> moves into forms of nature and then eventually the beloved. And when he's talking about this, he, he describes it as the, his religion is the religion of love, Deen al Um, And then when you look in his commentary to the Tarjuman, he connects the Deen al Hub to Muhammad as Habibullah. So the divine love, Hub, connected to Muhammad as Habibullah. And he basically says that the person who has attained the 
the station, uh, the Mohammedan station, can see all things as divine signs, as divine names. And all of these forms can be present in their heart. Um, and so in that sense, that's why I call him a Mohammedan pluralist. So he's approaching pluralism through the very specific dimension, uh, through, through the very specific path of Islam, but it does open on to a kind of universalism. It's quite clear. Um, and so, so again, like, uh, I, w I would say, you know, uh, I agree with Lipton that Ibn Arabi wasn't a perennialist in the sense that we define the term, but I do think he was a universalist in some sense. Right. And, and again, this speaks to the, the, the importance of there being more than one vision of, you know, not only religion, but of pluralism that um, we can take from the, in my view, from the traditionalists, from the perennialists, uh, where, it's, where it's useful. We can take from Ibn Arabi, we can take from Ramakrishna, we can take from contemporary thinkers, from people in our community. You know, one of the most valuable ways of doing comparative religion is, is I think, engagement and dialogue, what we're doing um, with people of other traditions. And they don't necessarily have to be, you know, authors or professors or scholars or, or even necessarily saints, although it's helpful to have those kind of encounters. Um, one can have that valuable exchange, um, what, you know, um, Dara Shakul called the, the, the merging of the two seas uh, mm -hmm. with, with one's neighbors, with, with one's friends and, and colleagues of another faith. And, and th those can be valuable exchanges when we realize that the sacred is, is with them uh, as much as it is with us. And, and certainly as much as it is with those who are esteemed to be experts in this or that. Um, so, so yeah, I, 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 think we, I think we need more than one vision. And I think it's, it's just in the nature of things that, that there is a, again, a, a plurality of, of not only religions, but a plurality of comparative religions. Mm -hmm.